somebody who particularly inspired me when I first, um, when I was trying to find a language or a way to write um, my book was Roberto Bolliano. Um, and he was really interested in both the, he really got this thing that I was wrestling with, which was that when you're talking about issues that so many people don't really want to think about, people go to great lengths to avoid thinking about, he understood that psychological stress that even, even the writer doesn't want to think about them, but how, you know, but how do you bring people in to something that, you know, that even, even my mother has a hard time getting involved in some of the work that I do and that challenge, that, you know, that, that ambivalence that you have about the work that you do and the work that you believe is important to do. You're not sitting there thinking, hey, this is important. Everybody needs to know about it right now and stomping your foot. You're trying, you're doing all sorts of, all sorts of intellectual gymnastics to try to figure out how to engage people. The thing that inoculates you from self-pity or this idea that what you're doing is so hard is whatever I'm doing, however hard it gets, the situations that the people I'm reporting on are in, they're 10 times harder than my own predicaments and they're finding a way to get around it. They're not sitting around wringing their hands. They're not feeling sorry for themselves. They're trying to get on with it. And so I kind of reject this idea that, you know, that, that we nonfiction writers who do difficult things should be, should be dining out on our own difficulties. Sure, it's difficult, but if you lose that sense of perspective, if you forget that it's way easier for you than it is for the people that you're reporting on, then I think maybe you just shouldn't do it. You know, because if you stop seeing that, you've got to be blind to many, many other things besides that. When I started making money on my book, I put it back in the community and I go back twice a year to make sure that things are, you know, things are happening that I hope would be happening. And how, is, how are people doing? I mean, everybody's different, right? I mean, and part of what my work tries to do is, 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 is not to generalize about communities and to insist that, that part of the problem in writing about poverty and development and globalization is this idea of that there might be some representative poor person or class of people when what I'm trying to say to the audience, whoever it might be, is that the people that I'm meeting in these communities, not just in India, but in the United States, including here in Denver, those people are every bit as complex as you are, reader. And if, if you can put that complexity in the page, then you can bring, possibly, possibly, you can bring the reader to a connection with those individuals that is, is, is more blooded and, and, crucially, I think, more respectful than pity. Um, and, you know, I think that empathy without a recognition of equality is worthless. Empathy itself is not the solution. It's the recognition. It's the recognition of equality that brings about change, I would say. Empathy doesn't solve a lot, I think. I wish it did, but I don't think it does. I'm deep into a project about uh, the future of work and social mobility in the United States. And I've been working on it with families I've known for 20 years. So um, it's, a, it's a project very dear to my heart, but I say that every project I do is very dear to my heart. You can't do it if it's not, really. They're all labors of love in their own way. <laughs>